Now we have our first talk of today, uh, uh, which is by Eamon Quinlan Gallego from uh, University of Michigan and University of Utah, uh, who is going to speak about uh, versions of the theory for singular rings in positive characteristics. Go ahead, Eamon. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for putting together this session and uh, for the opportunity to speak. And uh, okay, so. What I want to talk about is uh, kind of a modification of the theory of Bernstein's polynomials, which already made kind of a brief appearance in the previous talk. So the theory of Bernstein's polynomials is this kind of classical theory over the complex numbers. Um, and there's been recently two modifications to this theory, one to characteristic T and the other one to kind of singular algebras. Uh, and then what we want to do in this project uh, which I should say is joined with Jack Jeffries and with Nunez de Tancur, is asked, can we combine these two generalizations and look at singular algebras in positive characteristic? And so the outline of the talk is first I'll review the classical theory very quickly, then I'll explain, I'll explain these two recent modifications, and then I'll explain our, our results. So uh, let me begin with the classical story. So let's take a non-zero polynomial over the complex numbers. Um, and let's remember that the ring of differential operators here is the Weyl algebra. And this classical theorem tells us that there's a non-zero polynomial uh, B of S with in one variable, such that the following functional equation is satisfied for some differential operator P, which could also depend on this indeterminate S. Okay. Um, of course, P will depend on, on B. So if I change B, I, I have to change P, um, but the monic polynomial of, list, of least degree with this property, meaning that there is a differential operator for which we can satisfy such a functional equation, uh, this monic polynomial of least degree will be called the bernstein sato polynomial, and it is denoted by Bf of s. And this is the invariant that we're sort of interested in. Um, and before I move on, let me just make a quick remark that um, because we're working over the complex numbers now, so every polynomial just splits completely. and to give the data of the Bernstein sato polynomial is the same as giving the data of the roots and the multiplicities, right? So because the polynomial is monic, if I know the roots and I know the multiplicity of each root, I can recover the polynomial. And what we will see later is that in characteristic P, we only have a good analog of the roots, uh, but not of multiplicity. So, so the invariant in characteristic P is perhaps a little weaker. But we'll see that the roots already encode a lot of interesting information. So, so, okay, so we have this polynomial, we attach this invariant, the bernstein sato polynomial. And let me give you a couple of brief results to illustrate how this invariant works, although I'm really not doing any justice to how deep uh, this theory goes. So uh, the first one is the, the theorem of Kashiwara, which says that the roots are rational and negative, okay? So even though a priori this polynomial is, you know, it's a polynomial over the complex numbers. It could have arbitrary roots. Uh, the roots are rational and negative, and therefore, um, so are the coefficients. Right? The coefficients are also rational. Um, um, right. So, so this theorem will reappear throughout the talk as we uh, see different incarnations of this theorem in different settings. And uh, I also want to mention this theorem of color just to give a, an idea of what kind of information this invariant captures. So. The log canonical threshold of the polynomial is the smallest root of the Bernstein sato polynomial up to this uh, sign change. And right, so, so from the Bernstein sato polynomial, for example, we recover this log canonical threshold, which, uh, if you're not familiar, is an invariant that comes from complex analysis and has very deep applications in birational geometry. So, so this Bernstein sato polynomial really is capturing very subtle stuff about the singularities of F. All right, so, so let me now, so, so this concludes the discussion of the classical theory net. Let me now move on to uh, positive characteristic. So this, this first modification was developed by Mustata and Pitun in two different papers, and it works roughly as follows. So we take a non-zero polynomial now with coefficients in a perfect field of characteristic P. And now what's the, what's the first, obstruction we encounter, right? So in characteristic zero, I've introduced to you the bernstein sato polynomial via this uh, functional equation. And there's really no good analog to what this should be in a positive characteristic, right? 
um, such a the analog of such a functional equation. But um, let me say that Malgrange has an alternative characterization of the Bernstein set polynomial that is really well suited to just mimicking in characteristic P. And although I'm not going to discuss this alternative characterization, I'll give you an alternative definition of, of these invariants later. Um, but let me just say that for now, what we attach to this polynomial f are a bunch of a priori p-adic integers that I like to call the Bernstein-Sato roots of f, even though uh, Mustata and Bitun have different terminology for, for these objects. But as I said, just um, we attach a finite collection of p-adic integers. And even though these um, invariants come from mimicking this, what I call here the Malgrange approach, let me say that at the end, they turn out to be very familiar invariants if you know about test ideals. So we do prove that uh, the Bernstein's have the roots of f are given by the negatives of the f jumping numbers that have no p in the denominator and that lie in the interval between minus one and zero. Okay, and again, if you don't know about f jumping numbers, let me just mention that they're another set of now rational numbers, so no longer p-adic rational numbers that you attach to your singularity that also um, uh, kind of reflect the singularities of that. Um, so let me just point out a couple of corollaries from this theorem. So the first one is that because the f-jumping numbers are rational, uh, the Bernstein's out roots are also rational and negative. So we recover this first analog of Kashiwara's uh, theorem in characteristic P. And the second corollary is that um, if the f pure threshold, which is the smallest f jumping number, happens to have no p in the denominator, then, uh, then its negative is the largest Bernstein sato root of f. And this is a uh, analog of the theorem of Kollar because uh, this f pure threshold is somehow a characteristic p analog of the log canonical threshold. Okay, uh, let me now discuss the second modification of the theory of Bernstein Sato polynomials. So now we go back to characteristic zero and uh, we consider a finite type C algebra and we take a non zero polynomial F in there. Uh, I shouldn't say polynomial anymore, uh, just an element. And uh, yeah, I should say before I let me say so this was developed by th these two groups of authors that uh, are here in the title of the of the slide. All right, so, so let me introduce this definition. So we're gonna say that F is Bernstein Sato admissible if there's, if basically uh, the theorem of Bernstein and Sato holds for this element. So there's a non-zero polynomial such that um, you can satisfy such a functional equation for some differential operator. And the differential operator is allowed to depend on the indeterminate. And again, the monic polynomial of least degree with this property is called the Bernstein Sato polynomial. And I'll denote it with the same notation, although if I want to make reference to the ring R, I'll, I'll use this superscript. Um, let me say, I think in, in uh, the paper by Alvarez Montaner, Kunik, and Nunez de Tancur, this is called admitting a Bernstein Sato polynomial as opposed to Bernstein Sato admissible, but I like this notation because it'll set up uh, what I'm, what's coming up later. Better. Okay, so with this, let me give you their theorem. So, if R is a direct sum end of a polynomial ring S, so a priori R could have singularities uh, now, uh, but we still recover uh, Bernstein and Sato's theorem. So all non-zero elements of R are Bernstein-Sato admissible. They admit a Bernstein-Sato polynomial. And moreover, the Bernstein-Sato polynomial F viewed as an element of R is the same, uh, sorry, divides the Bernstein-Sato polynomial of F viewed as an element of S. Okay, so this is the, I just copied the theorem uh, to point out a quick corollary. So the corollary is we can recover the theorem of Kashiwara again, uh, because the roots of the Bernstein Sato polynomial of R are all roots of the Bernstein Sato polynomial of S and S is regular. And we have the just standard Kashiwara's theorem. Uh, we conclude that all the roots of the Bernstein Sato polynomial over R are also rational and negative. So let me let me now point out this question though. So uh, suppose that F is a Bernstein Sato admissible element in an arbitrary finite type C algebra, not necessarily a direct sum. Um, when are the roots rational and negative? So if you assume that it admits a Bernstein Sato polynomial, and I should point out that there is examples um, where you can prove that 
you, you don't have admit aberrancy inside the polynomial, but if you do admit aberrancy inside the polynomial, under which conditions will the roots be rational and negative? And as far as I know, in characteristic zero, this question has uh, no answer beyond uh, the direct sum end case. Um, and we'll see in characteristic P, we have a really nice condition we can put on R that basically ensures this. All right, so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, now I, I go over to our work. So our goal is to combine these two generalizations or modifications. So we want to develop these Bernstein Sato invariants for singular algebras in positive characteristic. So let me now go back to characteristic P. So I'll take R to be a, poly, a finite type K algebra where K is a perfect field of positive characteristic and I'll take an, some element of this algebra. And before we move on, let me recall, uh, this has already made an appearance, I believe, that the ring of differential operators in the sense of Grotendieck is the union of subrings DER, where DER is sometimes called the differential operators of level E. And this subring DER is the endomorphism ring of R over its P to the ETH Frobenius subring. So these DERs form sort of a, an increasing union of subrings. And um, right, so so now what I want to work towards is give you this alternative definition of the Bernstein Sato roots. And the problem is they're going to be a little unmotivated, but uh, let's go let's go through it. So if we fix an integer e, uh, an integer n will be called a differential jump of level e. If the de submodule generated by the nth power of f is different to the de submodule generated by the nth n plus first power of f. Okay, so the right-hand side is always contained on the left-hand side, but when that inclusion is strict, we will call that a differential jump of level e. And I want to also give a name to the collection of all differential jumps of level e, and I'll call them with this curly b sub f of p to the e. Um, so this curly b f is, is nothing but a collection of non-negative integers, and we can, we can extract a couple properties about these subsets of non-negative integers um, pretty straightforwardly. So first one is that they come in a decreasing uh, chain. And this just happens because the, the differential operators of the higher and higher level form an increasing chain. So it's very straightforward. The second one, yeah, requires a proof but is not too difficult either. So if you have a differential jump of level E, which is bigger than or equal to P to the E, you can subtract P to the E and remain a differential jump of level E. And the way I like to think of the second property is somehow telling me that the only interesting range for differential jumps is between zero and P to the E. Because if I had something that was bigger than or equal to P to the E, um, I could subtract P to the E enough times to land inside of this interesting interval and detect it that way. Okay, so here's the definition, this alternative definition of Bernstein Sato root. So a piadic integer is called the Bernstein Sato root of f. If uh, this alpha, my piadic integer, is a piadic limit of a sequence of non negative integers such that uh, the eth element of the sequence is a differential jump of level e. Okay, so somehow I require my sequence to go jumping further and further on this chain. And when you take the piadic limit, you obtain a Bernstein Sato root, and, and that's, that's what we call a Bernstein Sato root. Um, let me mention, though, so when I was discussing the work of Mustata and Bituna, I said that they, what they do is they, are, they adopt this Malgrange approach to the Bernstein Sato polynomial. And let me just mention really quickly that the definition we have here is equivalent to the one you obtain with the Malgrange approach. And in fact, if you look at the paper when it comes out, you will see that we take this as a definition and we prove really everything that we want to prove about Bernstein, about Bernstein Sato roots using this definition. And then we leave it for later to prove that it agrees with this mod range approach. Okay, so even though the, this definition that I gave is pretty concrete, it's a little bit to wrap your head around what's actually happening. So I want to just discuss a quick example. So here I've copied the definition again of Bernstein's at the root. And let's consider this example. So I take a prime P, which is bigger than two, and I take the coordinate ring of the cusp over a field of characteristic P. Um, then, the diff you can compute the differential jumps uh, for the element t squared, and they're p to the e plus one over two, 
and p to the e minus one. These are the two that land in what I called before the interesting range between zero and p to the e. And all other differential jumps arise as p to the e translates of these two. Okay, so add a multiple of p to the e to these two and you obtain a differential jump of level e. Okay, so if I want to find the Bernstein Sato root, I have to pick a sequence um, here and take piadic limit. So if I take any to be p to the e plus one over two, and I take piadic limit, um, recall that the piadic norm of p to the e goes to zero as e goes to infinity and, and I get one half. So one half is a Bernstein Sato root of t squared. And if I take the other one, um, I get minus one as a Bernstein Sato root. And in fact, you can convince yourself that these are the only two um, Bernstein Sato roots in this setting. And of course, what's interesting about this example is that we see one half as a Bernstein Sato root. So namely, we have a positive Bernstein Sato root, and we know that this could not, this could not happen if our algebra was regular. Okay, so we see we see a reflection of the singularities of R here in this Bernstein Sato root. Um, all right, so what I want to do next is discuss this notion of Bernstein Sato admissibility. So let me recall that in characteristic zero. When you have a singular algebra, we define Bernstein Sato admissible as just saying that your polynomial admit, admits a, sorry, your element of your ring admits a Bernstein Sato polynomial. And because in characteristic P, we don't take this approach using functional equations, it's not clear what, what we should call Bernstein Sato admissible. But we propose the following definition. So we will say that F is Bernstein Sato admissible if there's some bound K such that for every e, um, we can bound the number of differential jumps in the interesting range between zero and p to the e by k. And of course, k should not depend on e. Right? So this is somehow saying that there's not too many differential jumps. Right? Like In the interesting range, as e gets bigger and bigger, uh, the number of differential jumps doesn't increase. So it remains bounded. And what I want to do now is uh, illustrate why I think this is a good definition. So let me discuss this theorem. So if R satisfies one of these, then all elements of R are Bernstein Sato admissible. So first one is if R is regular, right? So if whatever notion of Bernstein Sato admissible, we really want to ensure that um, when R is regular, all elements are Bernstein Sato admissible, and this in fact happens. And, and in this setting, this is really uh, the discreteness of the F jumping numbers, which in this setting is proved by Blickle, Mustat, and Smith. So this is really not our, our result. What we do prove is that we can recover the theorem of Alvarez, Montaner, Kuneki, and Nunez, Betancourt in characteristic P. So if R is a direct sum end of a regular ring, we still have uh, Bernstein Sato admissibility for all elements. And then what's interesting is in characteristic P, we also have one more class of singularities on, for which we can ensure that all elements are Bernstein Sato admissible, and that is this uh, graded with finite F representation type. And I think these class of singularities already are came up in Giuseppe's talk. Um, and I, I'm not gonna define it, but I want to give you a couple of examples of what these kind of include. So for example, if you take a polynomial ring and you kill a monomial ideal that has F of RT, or you could take, for example, a monomial curve like the coordinate ring of the cusp and that also has F of RT. So um, to finish up, just a few more results that I want to discuss to illustrate these invariants. So, um, right. So, for, first of all, if we are Bernstein Sato admissible, right, in characteristic zero, this kind of meant like admitting a Bernstein Sato polynomial. And in characteristic P, okay, there's no polynomial, but it better be true that you have a finite number of Bernstein Sato roots, which is not immediate from the definition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, right. So, and this happens if, under the assumption of Bernstein Sato admissibility. And now comes what I mentioned before, right? So, Actually, if I assume that I have a Bernstein Sato admissible element and that my ring is F split, then I can ensure that all the Bernstein Sato roots are rational and lie in the interval between minus one and zero. So, so this is a condition we can put to assume that, to, to conclude that Bernstein Sato roots are rational. And secondly, okay, so what happens if all Bernstein Sato roots are rational and non-positive? Um, so, we can we have the following result as well. So if we have a domain and we assume that the Bernstein Sato roots of all elements are non-positive, then we can conclude that R is semi-normal. And the, 
the definition of semi-normality is here. Let me just say that a prototypical example of a non-semi-normal ring is the coordinate ring of the cusp. And indeed, in our previous example, we found a positive Bernstein subtle root that kind of reflects the fact that this ring is not, not semi-normal. And uh, finally, let me say, so there is something that should make you a bit uncomfortable about this theorem and this proposition, and it's the appearance of zero, right? So in characteristic zero, we know the roots are negative, not just non-positive. And then the question arises, so, okay, so what's up with this zero? When are the Bernstein subtle roots zero? And uh, when can you have zero as a Bernstein subtle root? And, and in fact, we can also completely characterize this. So if you have an F-split domain, which by the th first theorem ensures that uh, you have rational and non-positive roots, uh, then the following are equivalent, actually. So to have non-zero zero not be a root of, not be a Bernstein subtle root of every non-zero element is actually equivalent to the ring being strongly F regular. Okay, so if you're not familiar, this uh, F splitness and F, this F strong F regularity, they're kind of, uh, how to say, characterizations of singularities that are very, very familiar in the theory of, uh, yeah, the theory of singularities and characteristic P. Okay, uh, sorry, I'm a bit over time. I'll finish here. Thank you very much. Um, before we go to questions, uh, you you asked me to, to remind you about the ideas. More oh, the yes, ideas. yes. <laughs> I know it for yet. So yeah, I, although I've discussed everything for polynomials, uh, there's a notion of, of Bernstein's at, uh, Bernstein at the root for ideals and Bernstein's at the polynomials for ideals. And everything that we do works for ideals, not just for, or almost everything. I think this last theorem, we, this last proposition, we don't have for arbitrary ideals, but almost everything else. Uh, works. Thanks, Rhys. Okay, no problem. Uh, are there more questions? Oh, I, I have a question. Maybe you said this and I, I missed it. But so at the end of the day, do you prove that your notion of Bernstein Sato admissible is the same as the other one? Uh, kind of. The, the problem is that the analogy between characteristic zero and characteristic P doesn't work so well that you can actually make that very precise, right? So, so what's behind this is this Malgrange approach that I was working very hard to avoid. But basically, uh, what Malgrange proves is that you can characterize the Bernstein subtle polynomial as a minimal polynomial that acts on some module. Um, and so, admitting a Bernstein subtle polynomial is the same as having this module split as a direct sum of uh, multi eigen, sorry, generalized eigenspaces and what we prove in characteristic P is that having Bernstein subtle admissibility, admissibility implies that the module, this module splits as a direct sum, but not now that they're not now they're not generalized eigenspaces, but rather some kind of like multi eigenspace thing. So the, there's a good analogy, but it's not as sharp as as you might expect. But that's just because the the, the behaviors are different, and you cannot make like a strict analogy really. Thank you. Can I, can I ask another question? Yeah, please. Um, so do you, do you guys have any examples where you have some, some polynomial that is not uh, Bernstein Saito admissible and it ha actually has an infinite set of these, oh. these roots in your sense? Yes, yes. I mean, I think the only example that we have of this is, um, this already made an appearance, I think, in Yaidon's talk. So this example of BGG, where you have a ring of differential operators with no negative degree, so you can prove it if you take something in the maximal ideal there, because you can't bring down the degree. Um, that's not Bernstein subtle admissible, and and in fact you have a an infinite number of Bernstein subtle. Like every p-adic integer is a Bernstein subtle root for this thing. Uh, you know that's kind of like, you know I would like to know an example where you have like something that's not a Bernstein subtle root and something that is a Bernstein subtle root, but you have infinitely many Bernstein subtle roots. Uh, but I. I can't think, I don't think we have such an example. Yeah, maybe Jack can correct me or, or at least. But I, I, I don't, I don't think, think we do, yeah. Okay. Can, can the opposite happen though? Can you have something that is not for insane side of admissible but still has finitely many? Uh, uh, that's a very good question, yeah. Uh, I don't know is the answer, I don't know. Right, yeah, so, so I was careful before when I said that 
when you are Bernstein set to admissible, this module, Malgrange module, it splits. But I don't know if the converse is true, that if the Malgrange module splits into a direct sum of finitely many multi eigen spaces, then you must be Bernstein set to admissible. I, I don't know. But it's a good, it's an interesting question. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, you said you have a question? I have a uh, curiosity. I mean, in characteristic zero, you have examples of uh, something that is not a differential jump, but you still have a, a root of the mm -hmm. So this phenomenon doesn't appear, right? In no, in characteristic P, this doesn't happen. And uh, it's kind of a, something that is related to Eloisa's question when she said, like, what's the analogy between characteristic zero and characteristic P? And the biggest difference is that in characteristic zero, Right, so so the Bernstein Sato polynomial is something like uh, an element of a on a polynomial ring in one variable. But in characteristic P, um, instead of having a polynomial ring in one variable that acts, what acts on the relevant module is this ring of continuous functions from ZP to uh, FP, and that module is actually has a name for this. Like that, sorry, that ring is what is called von Neumann regular or absolutely flat, meaning that every module for this algebra is flat. And so actually specializing to a certain p-adic integer and looking at uh, differential jumps, um, you don't lose any information by doing that. Whereas of course in characteristic zero, as, as you mentioned, uh, yeah, specializing S is a very, uh, right, it's, it's a non-trivial operation. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Well, we, we thank Eamon again.